David, thank you for taking the time to have another conversation with me on behalf of uh, the whole IMEX team. Um, we're going to be talking about your presentations and sessions at IMEX America. So sincere thanks. I know you're super busy. Oh, um, and super excited about IMEX America. <laughs> super excited to have another uh, any conversation with you is a good conversation, my friend. <laughs> thank happy. you. Thank you. I always enjoy it. Well, I'm here. I'm representing today. I'm representing the event planners who may know a little bit about value graphics and the event planners who know nothing about value graphics. And I'm going to be representing their ability to really understand what it means. So I'm going to be getting into the weeds if you take me into the clouds. I hope that's okay. So I'm going to ask you a question, David. I've got it written down so I don't get it wrong. And it's about one of your sessions at IMEX America. Bring everyone back. An MPI at IMEX and value graphics research world premiere, I like the sound of that. Can you take me further into this takeaway? Learn how to look past demographic stereotypes to supercharge engagement. What does that mean? What am I going to learn? First off, let's talk about the word world premiere. Every time we speak to an audience, the exciting thing about the research and the database we use to create all of our findings on behalf of the audiences we speak to is it's always custom. So this is not a rehashed speech that's been used somewhere else. Just for IMAX, and thanks to our friends at MPI who are sponsoring Spark Monday, we've done a study specifically on who is still reluctant to come back to in-person events. And we call the study the reluctance for obvious reasons. Now, here's the piece about demographics. We all sit around when we're starting to work on an event or a conference or a meeting, whatever it is we're doing, and we start trying to understand who's going to come. And we think about it based on demographic ideas. How many of them, like what's the percentage of male versus female? What kind of income bracket are they in? Are they married? Do they have kids? What is it? What do we know about them? And we write all this stuff down. We say, that's our target audience. And then we go and try and do stuff, create events, design things, come up with strategies, put the plans together, all the things that meeting planners have to do to make these things successful based on this idea of who we're doing it for. But here's the problem. We've done half a million, almost 600,000 surveys now around the world to measure what people really care about, what's important to them, what they look for in every aspect of their life. And when we look at those categories, male, female, 18 to 24, 25 to 36, 37 to 45, income brackets, married, number of kids, all those demographic labels, the people inside each one of those groups have so little in common. In fact, about 10% in common. So think about that for a moment. If you're targeting people who are 25 to 36 years old, and they only resemble each other 10% of the time, then you spend a dollar trying to talk to them, you're wasting 90 cents. You're trying to design a program or an event or a meeting for them based on what you think you know about them because they're that age and this gender and that marital status and this occupation, you're wasting 90% of your effort because people do not resemble each other inside those buckets. Okay, and but here's where I'm gonna represent you because I, I've been taught demographics. Mm. I know event planners have been taught demographics. Our business is virtually set up on data points that meet those demographic graphics. Yeah. So how are we going to move past that um, towards better engagement? What, what step do I need to take? Do I need to sort of build my data points again? Can it, is it, I mean, that's a pretty big ask. So where's the sweet spot between moving from where we've been, which doesn't work, which I'm hearing really clearly to where we need to get to? Yeah, they overlap and they layer on top of each other. Demographics are still useful to tell us what people are, but they don't tell us who people are. So if let's just, let's just paint a little picture. If you put 100 people in a room and you know that they're all women, how closely do you believe that they're going to resemble each other? Other than the fact that they're women, they're going to be all different kinds of people. And if those women were all 57 years old, does that mean they all believe the same things and love the same things and value the same things just because you know those two things about them? No. Is it important to know those two things about them? If you have a product or a service designed specifically for 57-year-old women, of course it is. You still need to know that you've got the right people in the room. But what we've been doing wrong with demographics is assuming that it tells us who those people are and what drives them. 
and what they love and what they're going to run towards and what they're chasing in their lives. So now they go back to that same room, about 57 year old women, hundred of them in a room. If I could just tell you that the most important thing that they have in common, that they all believe is so important that they use it to make all their decisions all day long is let's say personal growth. Suddenly it snaps into view. I know how to talk to these people. I need to tell them that the thing I'd like them to do is going to give them an opportunity to grow as a human. It doesn't really matter if they're 57 year old women or not, but sure. It's cool because maybe you are specifically want to talk to 57 year old women, but what we're missing and what we're asking demographics to do, and it's not suited for this is to tell us what these people care about. And that's where value graphics comes in. You layer it on top of your demographics. So now you know who you're talking to and what they care about. And it just right. gives you so much more power. So that's what we've done for this keynote is we've studied people who are reluctant to come back to in-person events. And we can tell you exactly that room full of people called reluctance. They have some demographic characteristics. Of course they do. They have some psychographic characteristics. Of course they do. Now we know what it takes to get them to do the things we'd like them to do, which is to get over their reluctance and come back to in-person events. I'm going to teach you how to use that information. Oh, I'm going to have to be there and sold that one to me, buddy. Well done. I like that very much. Okay. So my next question, and thank you for that. You really made it clear when I, when, when I pressed you. I, I get it now. Oh, no um, problem. Love it. So your second or one of your other sessions, not your second one, but one of your other sessions is connecting the dots, making this research come to life for your next event. And I'd like you to explain a little bit more about one of the takeaways you're going to be giving on that day, which is how to create a marketing strategy that delivers exactly what attendees want to hear. Now, caveat for the event planners listening. I know you're not marketers, but you actually are. And you're probably um, going to be more reliant on your marketing skills than ever in the context in which we're all doing business right now in 2021, right? So I'm representing that marketing part of the, of the event planner's brain right now. What do attendees want and need to hear from us? Um, and obviously we're talking about the reluctance. Absolutely. Here's an interesting thought just to build on what you said a moment ago. Whether you wanna give yourself the label or not, we are all marketers every day. We are all united by waking up every morning and going to do the thing we do. And our job is to try and convince some people to do something. That's marketing. We are all marketers. We're trying to convince some people to come to our show. We're trying to build a show in a way that will convince people to come to it. We're trying to talk to them about the show in a way that makes them go, this is the show for me. Uh, we're all in marketing. doesn't matter what we do. So at this particular session, I'm going to give you a couple of the data points that we found about the reluctance, the things that they use that drive their decisions and behaviors so that we'll just give this as one little example, of the kind of stuff you're going to find. So there's 56 things that drive humans to do what they do. We know this because of the 600,000 surveys we've done all over the world in 150 languages. It's pretty cool. And three that are in play in a huge way for the reluctance, the people who are reluctant to come back to live events are health and well being, positive environments, and security. So let's talk about those quickly. Positive environments, these people are negativity adverse. They do not want to hear that things are bad. They only want to hear messages about how things are okay and getting better. And that's mental, spiritual, emotional, physical, every aspect of their life. They will run towards anything that is positive and run away from anything that's negative and bad. So that's a good thing to keep in mind when you're trying to talk to them, particularly at this moment in our lives where we're so wrapped up in these bad things that are going on around us. Health and well-being, very important to them. And again, the connection back to the bad things that are going on around us right now. They're looking at that and going, I don't know if this is going to be good for my health and well-being. That's probably one of the reasons I'm reluctant. And lastly, they have a huge importance that they place on the value of security. They want to know that they're okay and that everything's going to be fine and there's no surprises. So what this tells me from a marketing perspective is that we need to communicate with them that their health and well-being is being looked after, it's all secure, and we have to do it in a positive way. We can't say to them, when you arrive, you'll be issued rubber gloves and you'll have to stand six feet apart from each other. And you're not allowed to touch anything that isn't belong to you and your room's been sterilized and there's going to be food served to you in closed 
closed plastic containers. You can't say that. You need to say all around the world, conferences have been going, have happening in real life. And there have been hardly any transmissions. There's been, I can look at, I, I was at MPIWEC two years ago, zero transmissions, 1500 people in a room, zero transmissions. We've got this folks, we're okay. We have all the systems in place. We have backup and redundancy systems for those systems. You can come and not even worry about this stuff. It's going to be fine. We've got you. Don't make it a negative. Do not reinforce the bad parts. Emphasize the good stuff and talk to them about how that's going to impact their sense of security they're looking for and the health and well-being that they crave. Okay, so moving on, David, I'm just going to come to the third or the third of one of your many sessions and ask you one more question. Uh, and again, I'm going to read it because I want to get it right. So there are three kinds of people, according to you. How are we going to bring them back? This is going to be called a Human Values Masterclass. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about that and maybe hone in again on one kind of person? If anything we've said today is triggering anyone to, to think this is interesting and they're keen to know more, sign up for this session. It's a very limited number of seats and it's a masterclass. And I love these because we get to dive deep into the data that we can only share a little bit of. I always refer to it as data iceberg tips uh, that we can share in a keynote setting. This is our opportunity to go deep and to really understand what we found about the reluctance. And here's the first thing we found, and that's that I named this session improperly. We called it three kinds of people, but guess what? There's only two kinds of people who matter when we're looking at this audience called the reluctance. There's people who are reluctant now who we can nudge and we can get them to come back. And then there's people who are always reluctant, always have been, and always will be. We need to separate those out from each other and realize that both are opportunities for us to plan transformative events for these very different kinds of people. You'd think they'd be quite similar, but they're actually quite different when we look at what's important to them, and what their values are, and how they make their decisions, and what's going to make them feel good which is our job, is to make them feel like they've had an amazing experience when they come to an event. So the people who are reluctant now, we're going to share all the values you need to understand in order to plan really great events that will get them to not be reluctant anymore and to move them into the right frame of mind so that they are nudged off the fence on the direction of coming back and uh, joining the ranks of those of us who like to be in hug space, as I like to call it. Uh, and then on the other side of the fence are the folks who are always reluctant at the moment they're using the pandemic as a reason to say why I'm reluctant. After the pandemic, they'll have another reason why they're going to still be reluctant. Guess who these people are? These are your digital attendees. If you also understand what they're looking for and what they're driven by and what their values are, now you can plan amazing events for them. Just realize they're not coming. So make those digital events as fabulous for them as the events that you're going to make for the folks, folks who come in real life. And that's what this session will be about. We're going to go deep on both of those sides of that fence, and we're going to figure out what we can do to make everybody talk about your event for a long time after they've been there. And here's the reason why I'm so hopeful about this. All we have to do to change the world is change the way we look at the world. And we have the ability to do that now. And that's what I'm going to give you when you come to IMEX and hear any one of these, hopefully all of these sessions that we've just talked about. I'm going to show you how to be eight times more effective. And I'm going to show you how to change the world. I think that's a pretty good reason to come. Thank you for your time, my friend. I hope our um, listeners and viewers have got something out of this. I really hope we can see a lot of people at IMEX America in the room in a sterile, I and mean, not in a sterile, but in a safe, not set sterile setting. And we will be doing our very best to make everyone feel comfortable, positive and safe, and just to, to kickstart business. That's what we're really looking forward to. It's Thank gonna, you. Don't miss it. Sign up. Come, come. <laughs>